Hello, and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy Rock preaches from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16, with a sermon titled, Giving Our Spirit to Jesus. Jesus generously gifts each of us to nurture our faith, deepen our understanding of Him, and grow into the image of Jesus. Together, we play a vital role in supporting one another rather than tearing each other down. Embrace the love that Jesus provides as the ultimate tool. Speak truth with love, build each other up with love, and give from a place of love. Love is patient, kind, and forgives without keeping a record of wrongs. We all face moments of being lost, but Jesus excels at rescuing souls from darkness and guiding them to heavenly grace. Our unity is a testament to Jesus' transformative power. Let's allow his love to shape and strengthen us. Hi, friends. Good morning. Uh, it's Christmas. So we, we decorate for Christmas in uh, late October in our house. And so uh, as long as I'm the pastor here, it'll just keep on going week earlier, earlier every year. So next year it's July. So we can't wait. Um, no, we did. Big thank you to everybody who decorated. We want to give people the weekend off of Thanksgiving. And so they did it last week. Uh, so hi, guys. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, uh, if you are new or visiting with our church, welcome. We are so glad you're here. Um, It's not an easy thing to come to a church for the first time, and so many of you have done that this year. We've grown by uh, 200 people in the life of our church this year. And so, so many of you are new, and I just want to welcome you. We do this every uh, week as a church, and we talk about what our vision is as a church because that's how our elders and our leaders make decisions in our churches and in this church, and it's how we spend our money, and it's what we focus on. Uh, So we believe three things. Number one, there's always hope beyond our brokenness, always. And so families this week that are experiencing financial brokenness came to this church, and they got enough food and money to get Thanksgiving on a table for them, and you were a part of that. That's amazing. Next, we believe that we are called to uh, trust in our risen Savior, And we're all learning how to do that together in little areas of our lives. One step at a time, one moment at a time, we learn to trust Jesus. Um, I don't know, it's kind of weird. We all have crises of faith all the time. That's what it looks like. We come to an area of our life where we don't quite know how to trust Jesus with this person or this situation or this diagnosis or this need or this desire, and then we learn how to trust him. And we we do the hokey pokey, right? (laughs) My way, God's way, my way, God's way. And but we need each other to learn how to trust Jesus in the middle of it all. And so we do that together as a church. And then finally we get to bring restoration. And so for those of us who got to volunteer this weekend, that was a moment of restoration. And then Kilo gets to bring restoration to someone's life this week because we all put a couple of dollars in a bucket to see what we could do there. And we do this over and over and over again in our church. And right now there's, there's six mostly pagan high schoolers and junior hires meeting with Kim across the street. And so Jesus bless Kim, our youth intern, and she loves them, right? So we do these things. We love the people in our lives, no matter where we are. Uh, and we bring restoration there. And we want that restoration for your heart, and we want it for people that don't go to our church yet, because we believe as a community that we're nothing less than the hell-breaking-down army of God's love and light in this world. Amen? Amen. So each one of those truths has a choice. That's just not like we don't just sort of believe those things and then go about our day. We actually choose those things moment by moment. And so we say this every week, and this is a thing that you can say every morning, right? Today, if you want to, choose this with me. Today, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first, and I choose to join Jesus in his resurrection work, right? So if you go out to lunch after this, and Jesus says to be generous to your server, that's joining him in his resurrection work. And if you go home today and your spouse or your kids are cranky, (laughs) 
You can seek Jesus first and then ask him, Lord, give me mercy and love them. Amen? These are choices we make every day. So I have a question for you. Can I speak to your heart of hearts this day? Is that all right? Fantastic. Can we pray real quick? Jesus, fill this place. Thank you that you've already filled this place with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for worship. And we now just bind and silence anything opposed to you, Jesus, that would be getting in the way of us hearing your word and your heart for us. Holy Spirit, come. We give you permission to speak to our heart of hearts. We say to our own souls, awaken, O my soul, and all that is within me, Lord, that I might know you and become more like you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. And all God's saints said, amen. Amen. Okay, so last week, we've been in the book of Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 right now. And the closer that we get to Christmas, we'll take a little break and, and, and do the Christmas story. But we're going to be up here for the next couple of weeks um, and in Ephesians. Um, so last week in Ephesians chapter 4, we talked about living in unity with each other. And I talked about how living in unity is tension. And that tension is good. It's not bad. It's actually really good. Tension is us making every effort to keep the unity that we have together. And that, that puts us in tension. Um, when you sacrifice time and money and emotional energy to love someone, there's tension there in your life, right? And that tension isn't bad. Uh, tension happens when people who love us are courageous enough to call us out on our stuff, Tension happens when we stay and deal with it rather than run so there is no tension in our life. Tension isn't bad. Tension also happens when the people that we love and care about make hurtful choices and we don't try and resolve our tension by berating them or controlling them, but instead we accept that they've made a difficult decision we tell them and communicate with them as best we can in love, but then at the same time, we, we take our hands off of them and say, God, you, you've got them. That's not easy to do. That creates tension in you. It's much easier to resolve your tension by saying, stop it! <laughs> right? Because as the tension builds, you want to do something. Now, God lives in this same tension with us because he's making every effort to build us up in unity and to unite him with us. God doesn't come down and smack you every time you make a decision that's wrong. Okay? Sometimes your, con- well, your consequences smack you all the time. You can choose to listen or not, right? But that ain't God. Okay? God is faithful to us when we're not. That creates tension. He lives with that. He chooses to live with that because he loves you. God is kind to us when we brutalize ourselves. He's merciful even when we hold on to resentments. He's generous to us when we refuse to give. God does that for us. God is the best giver of good gifts. Gifts that change our entire lives and our eternity for the better. And so Paul's message this week to the church is about our relationships with each other and how, and he's going to emphasize over and over and over again for a good reason that Jesus is the best giver ever. So that's where we're going today. And I didn't plan it this way that this passage about giving would be on Thanksgiving. But that's pretty cool, right? Speaking of which, we said a couple weeks ago we were $100,000 behind in our giving. And I just want to say thank you. We have been making that up. Um, And so you've been so generous. Uh, I think so far there's been over $50,000 in special giving to the church. So thank you so much. I appreciate your generosity. When you give next week on, you know, Giving Tuesday or whatever it is after you spend all your money on Cyber Monday, uh, just know that 
the work that you are doing in this church. We need your financial support. And, the, and our little church is making a massive difference in people's lives. So it's incredible. <laughs> and I, I love it that the, that the special giving that has happened in our church isn't just big givers, but it's people giving, here's an extra $10. Here's an extra $20. Here's an extra $50. And I know that though, that little amount of money is a lot to you and because I've been there before. And so thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. God is the best giver ever. Here it is. Uh, read this with me. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned to it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high... He took many captives and gave gifts to his people. So notice that the word give is repeated twice. That's why the, past, that's why the theme of this, and it's going to be, give is going to be repeated over and over and over again in this little section. So what in the heck does this mean? Well, first of all, Jesus gives gifts. What is it? What's, what's the first one? Uh, but to each one of us, grace has been given. Well, that's the first gift, grace, right? Jesus took us captives and set us free. That's a gift that I could not earn nor deserve. And then Jesus ascended on high, so he took the throne of heaven, and now sitting on the throne of heaven, we are right by his side, just like Ephesians chapter 2 said, and he's giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving us all the things that he has from now until all eternity. What? You realize heaven be Christmas every day. Right? Happens now, starts now. God gives us and gives and gives and gives us. Jesus gives you forgiveness when you don't deserve it, love that you could never earn, favor you couldn't pretend to qualify for, help and need, energy when you're exhausted, hope when all seems hopeless, the list of gifts goes on. Not to mention all the times that you needed something practical, that you needed someone with skin on to love you or to help you, and God shows up over and over and over again in those moments as well. Paul then takes a moment to explain something quite extraordinary about our God who is the best giver. Verse 9, are you ready? Read this with me. These are the verses that when you read in your Bible, you might often go, I don't know what that means, so let's just skip this and move on to something that feels more understandable, okay? But again, if you just slow down just for a moment and take it in, I know that you'll be able to understand this, okay? So here it is. Are you ready? What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Okay, now just think about that. If Jesus descended, or if he ascended, that means he once descended, right? Where did Jesus come from? Heaven. It's not Milwaukee, right? It's heaven. Great. It's not the ozone layer. It's heaven. He heaven, right? You say that with a B, a little bit of heaven. That's where he came from, heaven, right? So I just need you to understand this. Would you leave heaven for you? No. No, if you were in heaven and you looked at you and your life right now, would you go, yeah, they're worth it? Maybe, maybe, right? It'd be like you're on vacation, everything is perfect, right? The children are playing quietly. Somebody else has paid for it. You're with the love of your life, right? Or you, the children aren't there at all, right? <laughs> and you're with the love of your life and everything is good, right? Would you leave that, right, and go to Bakersfield? <laughs> no. No. Right? It wouldn't matter who called, right? It'd be like, no. 
right? If you're dying, then I have nothing I can do. I might as well just stay here, right? Just no, okay? Jesus set aside heaven. Every good gift that he deserves as the king of kings so that he could enter into our hell and earn for us and thus give us every good gift that we could never earn for ourselves. That's what it means when he descended. His descent was for our sake, for our salvation, so that we could be united with him. And then when Jesus ascended to heaven in the resurrection, he did that for us too. So that in his sovereign rule and reign over the entire universe, Jesus now works all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen? So that he can pour out unending love and mercy to you, even in the hot mess of your bad decisions and other people's bad decisions, which keep on wrecking things. Amen? Now, I still fall into the faulty thinking that I have to earn his favor back when I mess up. Because when I mess up, then his favor must be gone. Right? No gifts, only coal. Right? And I did it again this week. That's not how his ascension works. He took me, a captive, to my own sin and death, paid for it, freed me from it, to give me grace, which means, grace means that all the love and affection that I thought I lost when I stumbled actually never left me. God isn't, when we talk about God being holy and God being pure and God being all love, we often think, well, that must mean he don't like me when I'm not. No, he left heaven for you and for me. You're not scared of your muck and your sin and your death and your hell. He's he's living with you in it right now. He's united and bonded to you in it right now. He's never left you. He's never going to leave you. You don't have to earn your way back when you fail. He's right there with you. So why do I go back to this rotten strategy of not wanting to admit I'm wrong? I'm fine. No, I'm right. Back off. Why do I get defensive? Why do I then mix in a little gross dollop of being a martyr and say, no, poor me, I messed up again? (laughs) You ever do that? Oh, martyr's ugly, right? I know I hurt you, but look how much pain I'm in because I hurt you. That's, that's how gross martyr is, but I do that. Ah, uh, right? Uh. It's like eating, oh, no, I can't. I'm sorry. Okay, I have to. I love my mother-in-law so much, but... Um, She brought a zucchini to Thanksgiving and then stuffed it with quinoa because she's a vegan. That's the image of being a martyr, (laughs) right? Not that there's anything wrong with being a vegan and not that there's anything wrong with quinoa stuffed in a zucchini cooked in an oven for two and a half hours, but that compared to turkey, right? So there you go. Okay. That's it. Right? Why do I go back to being a martyr? Why do I go back to being defensive? Why do I go back to not wanting to admit when I'm wrong? Why do I go back to beating myself up? You know, it's all just dripping with this foul, stinky pride. Right? And that's so ridiculous. How can a captive rescued from hell, brought to heaven by the king of kings say, it's all about me? No. It's all about Jesus. 
It's all about Jesus. Why is this so important? Oh, for like a million reasons. But let me just say two. First, just notice, notice for a moment the majesty of Jesus and all that he gave up for you and what he still gives for you. And let the love of God, take a breath, let the love of God and his amazing grace make your heart alive. The hero of your story is not you, it's Jesus. And let that honor that he gives you sink in for a moment. God didn't send an angel or an ambassador or an Uber driver to pick you up from your hell. He came for you himself. That's how much he wants you. You have any idea how important you are? That the king of kings, that the creator of the universe chose you because he loves you because he wants you. Wow. Now, second, this might seem weird. And as much honor as I'm given by Jesus, my life then is now not about me. Right? I'm honored by God. I am irreplaceably valuable in God's sight. I am worthy of every good thing that he has given me, but now my life is not about me. Jesus has given and given and given to me so that now my love and efforts and kindness and generosity don't have to be bound with the obligation that the person whom I bless somehow has to make me feel amazing because I decided to be generous. Can I say that complicated sentence in a really simple way? Have you ever given a Christmas gift to someone and been mad that they didn't like it enough? That means that that gift was about you, not them. I mean, I did that to my family for years, right? My brother liked Transformers. I like G.I. Joes. I gave him G.I. Joes for Christmas. Why? Because the gift wasn't about him. It was about me. And when he didn't want to play with it, I had another, you know, assault truck in my collection, right? So then he started giving me Transformers, and then it was just out of control. Anyways... Here's the idea. Love is about the person I'm serving, not about my recognition for me serving. Generosity is about the mission I'm accomplishing, not about my ego. There ain't never gonna be plaques in this church for how much money we've given. Why? It's not about us. It's not about us. There ain't no assigned seating for who gets to give more, who, no, wrong. It's about Jesus, only about him. Kindness is about the person I'm blessing, not about my image. Look how great I am being kind. <laughs> it's so ugly. Work is about the beauty I help to create, not about me getting credit. And so because Jesus has honored me with everything I could ever have, I am now completely free to give. Next slide. I am now completely free to give like Jesus gives. With every ounce of energy and resource I have, so the person or people I serve would have overwhelming evidence that God's love for them is real. And as I give, Jesus will restore to me all I've given and more so that, read this with me, I can keep on giving. How's that song go? I've got a river of life flowing, flowing, flowing out of me. That means it's flowing into me and flowing out of me so that those who are lame now can walk and the blind can see do you see it? Do you understand how important your role is? The river is not about the river. You don't need to take credit for the life that's flowing in you and out of you. You just get the honor 
of being a conduit of God's incredible presence. Now, what Jesus gives us next is crazy good because it's, it's not about me, but then God will still honor you. This is nuts. Are you ready? Here it is. Verse 11. So, Christ gave himself, the apostles, the prophets, the event. So, Christ gave, Christ himself. Let me read that. Let's read that together so I... <laughs> Sorry, sometimes on Sundays I'm less dixic, and so that's the hard, okay? So here it is, verse 11, right? So Christ himself gave. Wait, that, that's three times now gave or given. Three times, right? That's why, I, that's why the sermon is all about that God is the best giver. Read it again. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, to equip his people, works of service. Works of service, works of giving. Now, I don't know if you've ever been sat through a really boring sermon about all of the gifts and what they do and whatnot, and you've thought to yourself, well, I don't have any of those. So let me just quickly explain to you what these are so that you can understand that most of you have a lot of them. First of all, our gifts are for each other. If you blaze new trails in any area of your life, you're, you're an apostle. That's what apostles do. We're starters. We blaze new trails. We start new things. We like to start things. We're the ones with the tip of the spear. We're the person that says, let's get it done. We make it happen. That's an apostle. Some speak the truth of God's heart and love as prophets. If your heart breaks for other people, for the world's situations, if you see a situation and go, that's not right, you're a prophet. Okay, that's what prophets do. Prophets is not about just predicting the future. Sometimes God will give you a vision or, a, or a, a premonition, right? If that's the case, if that's you, right? Let's, let's, let's buy stocks together, right? Let's, it'll be great. Um, but usually it has nothing to do with money. It usually has to do with something's gonna happen with this person, and so I'm gonna move to bless them because I know it's gonna be really, really hard or it's gonna be really good, and they need that encouragement. Does that make sense? That's what, that's what a prophet does. Some of us are friends whose love is so powerful that we're drawn closer to Jesus because they've gifted us with love. That's what an evangelist does. If you are a really good friend that loves your friends and loves your family members and just you keep on loving them and keep on loving them and keep on loving them until they go, what the heck are you doing? Why are you so nice? That's what evangelism is. It's the good news that you are sharing the good news. And it happens in word, it happens in deed, but that's what evangelists do. If you're an awesome friend, you're an evangelist, right? It's not someone who stands on a corner and like yells at people. That's not an evangelist, right? That's someone yelling at people on a corner, right? <laughs> Okay. Some of us can see the maze of life and we know what other people need to know in order to get from point A to point B. That's a teacher. Okay. So if, you, if you're able to have like a 30,000 foot view of things and you go, I know how to get there, then you have the gift of teaching. Congratulations. And it doesn't have to be about A, B, Z, and C's or theology. It can be about anything. If you know how to get things done and you can see the way forward and you want to explain that to someone in patience and love, golly, we need you, right? Because everybody's blind to something, yes? So the gift of teaching is all around in this. And then finally, the pastors. Pastors are called to show us through their vulnerability the way that God loves us in our deepest needs and in our greatest triumphs. If you are vulnerable with your life and you want to be vulnerable and, and give, like my job literally is just to show you how I fall flat on my face and where God shows up. Why? I can't fix you. Good Lord, that'd be the worst job on planet Earth. <laughs> it's true. I don't have enough time to teach you everything in the Bible every week so that I overcome how many hours of TV you watch that pulls all that out of your brain. <laughs> right? I cannot give you a comprehensive political worldview in 22 minutes on a Sunday morning. Sorry. My job is to be vulnerable with you so that you would see in the middle of your life when everything's falling apart that the God of the universe loves you. 
My job is to show you be, by being vulnerable with you and about how I actually there's successes in my life that you can make choices and do things that will actually help you with those. But most of all, my job is to show you what God, how God feels about you so that you draw close to him. If you do that, you're a pastor. That's what you do. So why are we given these gifts? Verse 11. Read this with me slowly. Ready? Oh, wait. Next slide. There you go. So that the body of Christ, read it loud, may be built up. Yeah. Until what? Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. So that we would be built up and that we'd be drawn together and that we'd actually grow. The Holy Spirit undoes the lie that people never change. Hogwash. We mature. We're growing into the spitting image of Jesus, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Man, that means I need you. That means we need each other. And we're called to build each other up, not tear each other down. Now, we tear each other down without even knowing it half the time. Sometimes we're very um, delightful or delighted in our ability to tear people down. Um, sometimes we want to just, you know what, um, golly, I just, I just got something to say. You know, have you ever thought about doing it this way? We don't see our criticism or our... Uh, or our anger as a way of tearing people down, or our absence as a way of tearing people down. But why tear people down when I'm only focused on me? I build people up when my eyes are fixed on Jesus. I tear people down when I'm angry, bitter, frustrated, unforgiving. I build people up when I forgive, when I ask for prayer, when I lean on my friends for help. You have no idea how important it is that you ask your friends for help. It builds them up because it allows the release of their gifts into your life. I tear you down when I take. I build you up when I give. I tear you down when I want to control it all. I build you up when I want Jesus to be in control. So I don't know. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to build others up or tear them down? Are you sure it's Thanksgiving week? You're going to be stuck with them for days. Days, right? I got wise. I'm sending Levi up to Seattle to see my family, right? They ain't coming down here, right? Ooh. Right? Oh, we can't make it this year, Mom. Why don't you go up there, Levi, right? right? So th there it is. What do you want to do? Would you allow Jesus to build you up? Yes. Would you allow others to build you up? That's trickier. Let's start with Jesus. Can, if you want Jesus to build you up, would you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, forgive me for tearing others down. Forgive me for tearing myself down. I need you, Jesus. Take a breath. Thank you for the people who are building me up. I receive them as a gift. Open your hands like you're receiving a gift. I choose to build them up. I take back my purpose, my love, my generosity, my humility, and my faith. I look back at my week and I can see all the people who build me up. It's overwhelming. Sandra keeps on texting me day a week, week after week, building me up. Thank you, Sandra. People give me wisdom that I don't have. Thank you. People speak to me hard truths I don't want to hear, and I live with attention in that. Thank you. The list goes on. I was talking to Mia this week, and we were talking about isolation. And for years, it was way easier for me to isolate, right? No tension. <sighs> I'm alone. I can do what I want. No tension with anybody, right? Then when I am with people, I'll just perform. So please love my performance, right? And then I'll isolate in the background so you never see my hot mess, okay? And isolation is beautiful. Oh, There's no tension in my life, right? 
And I don't want to get hurt again, but I said stuff like, you know, it's easier this way, or, you know, I just, you know, that's just how it is, or that's what I do, or, you know, uh, you know, whatever, or, hey, you know, I just, you know, I, I got a few close friends, but not a lot of close, you know, I just, I, I would say, I would justify my isolation with those words, but I've had friends these past couple of years who've refused to let me isolate, and annoying as that is, I, now I knew why, that isolation is terrible, but being loved and built up is absolutely amazing. So then Paul says, verse 14, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Why is Paul in the middle of all this throw this curveball in here? Why? And I'll end with this here just shortly. Okay, why? Why does Paul throw the curveball in here this way? Why is Paul concerned about being tossed around by others or others scheming, leading you astray? Because he was. Paul didn't wake up when he was 12 years old and go, I want to murder people for God. He didn't. He thought, God, I love you so much. I want, to keep your, I want to keep your people holy. I want to see the whole nation of Israel love you and adore you. God, I give my whole life to you. That's how his journey to become a rabbi started. It was other people who led him astray and said, in order to get people to change, you got you to you hit them. And so Paul says this, instead of... Using violence, verse 15, this is the hardest verse in the whole book of Ephesians. Read, read, read this with me. Instead, speaking the truth in love. Dang it! We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. I want to be the head so that when I speak words in love, people will follow what I say. Like, Jesus, I don't want to do it your way. I want to do it my way just for a moment so they really get the message. <laughs> it's the hardest verse in the book of Ephesians, right? Oh, man, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, like, how about I just, like, smack them in love? How about if I just bomb them in love? No, 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 no. I speak to them in love. There's a little elementary school girl. She's nine years old. She lost a class member. Uh, her friend died. It was her neighbor across the street as well. She's in her same elementary school class. And uh, her family found out, and they were just so distraught. And, and they're, you know, little girl's like, Mommy, I want to go over there. And they're like, no, 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 don't, you know, don't go over there. Nothing you can do. But this little girl bolted out the door and ran over to the neighbor's house and parents are kind of froze. What do we do? You know, like we don't want to intrude on the grief. And so they just, the front door opened and the mother who had just lost her own child answers the door and, you know, she looks up across her friends and neighbors and she waves and little girl walks in. She comes back an hour later and dad says, where, where were you? And she goes, well, I went to help. And her dad said, what help could you give a grieving mother? And the little girl said, well, I climbed up on her lap, and then we just cried together. Aww. And that was enough. It's just love, guys. It's just love. Love's enough. Like when, when people would call our church a couple of years ago and they would ask for help, I would give them the name of like Salvation Army or like other places to go. And then we did a prayer retreat and Augie who goes to our church didn't have a place to live and Debbie and I were leading it and Debbie said, no, she's a prophet, that's wrong. We're gonna do something about it because she's an apostle too, right? And then all of a sudden, 
we found Augie a place to live and somebody in the church co-signed for in his apartment and, and then he got jobs and then he didn't have any furniture so then it was like, well, let's get him some furniture and so then you all donated furniture and then we got Augie's place full of furniture and then we thought, well, who else needs furniture? And there's five other families that needed furniture and then all of a sudden it was, well, well let's get furniture and then Sherrod and Rob have destroyed their backs for the kingdom of God, but, <laughs> but now, right? And now we are the church that other churches say, well, if you need help, call Coastal. I don't refer people out anymore. Why? Love. Love. And it wasn't my love. It was Rob's love. It was Sherrod's love. It was Debbie's love that started this. You loved my son, Jonah, who has disabilities in incredible ways. And now there are eight amazing people in our church that come who have disabilities because you loved him well. Yeah, but Andy, what about when you love others and they don't receive it? What about those who turn and hurt you over and over again? What about, what about my family coming this week? What do I do then? Well, you, you speak the truth in love, right? And maybe... Maybe the truth that they need to hear is just that you're glad that they're there. And for the people in your life that don't want unity with you, right? Often what we do in trying to keep them around is that we, we grab them. And that grabbing feels like strangling to them. I'm not asking you to give up on people in your life that don't want to be united with you or your family. I'm not asking you to like, just cut them out completely. I'm just saying that you can love them and not strangle them when they want to go their own way. Why do I say that? Because you're sitting here right now. And you were a captive. And you were dead. And you were lost. And you didn't come home because someone strangled you. You came home because the God of the universe, who's the best giver ever, gave you every gift that you needed in order for your hearts to be saved and awakened and alive. And now you're here. Amen. And those people, the people that you love, that don't want to be united with you, that you maybe need to love from a distance right now with kindness, they'll have their story too. And so, Jesus, I just pray for the hearts of my friends here today. If you would, just open your hands like you're receiving a gift, friends. I pray for each one of them now. Holy Spirit, come fill them with every gift that they need. Awaken in them the spiritual gifts that you've given them. Awaken in them the love and the sacrifice and the care for their family. Give them wisdom and whimsy to deal with really hard twits that are coming to dinner this week. <laughs> and God, if they're the twit, show them to bring us to repentance and humility, to, that we would be so honored that in our captivity you loved us, God. Bless my friends. Seal these good words in their hearts this day. And I just pray against all the plans the enemy has to steal, rob, uh, or mess up what, God, what you've done here today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. We have lime and cilantro-infused rice with empanadas. I'm not even kidding. Give your server a tip. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Go across the street to Table Talk if you want to pray this into your bones. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his delight in you, and give you the peace that passes all understanding. Happy Thanksgiving. God bless you. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California, and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.